the U.S. soldier who ran into North Korea is back in U.S. custody, and will the Defense Secretary's salary become just one dollar? All of that and more, today, September 28th, 2023. Good morning, early birds. I'm Jonathan Lairfeld, and this is the Early Bird Brief, produced by Defense News and Military Times. First up, the White House said the U.S. soldier who sprinted into North Korea across the heavily fortified border between the Koreas two months ago was released into American custody. Earlier, North Korea had said it would expel Private Travis King. Some analysts expected the North to drag out his detention in hopes of squeezing concessions from Washington amid high tensions. Here's what happened. Swedish officials took King to the Chinese border. The U.S. ambassador to China, the Swedish ambassador to China, and at least one U.S. Defense Department official met him there. Biden administration officials insisted they provided no concessions to North Korea to secure the soldier's release. King was being flown to a U.S. military base in South Korea before being returned to the U.S. We appreciate the professionalism of our diplomats who worked with their counterparts at the Department of Defense and coordinated with the governments of Sweden and the People's Republic of China. And we thank Sweden and the People's Republic of China for their assistance in facilitating that transfer. Officials said they did not know exactly why North Korea decided to expel King. They said they suspected that Pyongyang determined that, as a low-ranking service member, he had no real value in terms of either leverage or information. A senior administration official told the Associated Press King was in good spirits and good health upon release. A quick refresher, King, who had served in South Korea, ran into North Korea while on a civilian tour of a border village on July 18th. He was supposed to be heading to Fort Bliss in Texas, following his release from prison in South Korea on an assault conviction. He became the first American confirmed to be detained in the North in nearly five years. But his fate remains uncertain. He was declared AWOL by the U.S. government. That could mean punishment by time in military jail, forfeiture of pay, or a dishonorable discharge. In the near term, officials said their focus would be on helping King reintegrate into the U.S. society upon his return. Officials said King will be taken into an Army medical center in Texas. He's expected to undergo psychological assessments and debriefings. North Korea's news agency alleged King journeyed into the country because of inequality and racism in the U.S. military. But it is impossible to verify the authenticity of those claims. A senior White House official told the AP... King was, quote, very happy to be returning to the U.S. In other news, House Republicans yesterday approved a measure as part of debate on the fiscal 2024 defense appropriations bill to slash Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's salary. Based on their dissatisfaction with his work so far, they voted for his $221,000 annual salary to be about $1. For more on this and an update on the potential government shutdown, Military Times Capitol Hill Bureau Chief Leo Shane III joins the episode today. So I understand GOP lawmakers approved multiple proposals to cut salaries for Defense Department positions they dislike. Can you tell us more about the measure to lower Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin's salary? Why was that introduced and is it likely to become law? Yeah, look, this this probably isn't going to become law. This is political posturing by uh, by House Republicans as part of their annual defense appropriations bill. Um, the, the Republicans this week are trying to push through the, their budget bills for the Defense Department next year uh, ahead of some of the shutdown stuff. This bill won't directly affect that, but they are doing a lot of messaging with it, talking about things they like with Defense Department, things they don't. Uh, there's provisions in here dealing with the abortion policy, provisions dealing with uh, transgender medical care in the military, recruiting, retention things, uh, elimination of a lot of diversity and uh, quality uh, uh, training programs. Um, what they did here uh, was a, a amendment with from uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene out of Georgia that would reduce the defense secretary's salary from over two hundred thousand dollars down to one dollar, and this is uh, this is what it sounds like. They don't like the job he's done. They blame him for some of the chaos with the Afghanistan withdrawal. They blame him for the recruiting problems. They blame him for making the military too woke. So, uh, with along with his position, there was a couple of other 
diversity and inclusion positions. Um, Sean Skelly, who's a transgender woman who serves in uh, the highest ranking transgender individual to serve in uh, in the administration. Um, they've reduced her salary down to uh, a dollar as well. So, I mean, these are, you know, Democrats decried these as just political attacks, just nothing more than, than pettiness trying to uh, single out individuals they don't like who they can't fire, but they can mess around with their salaries. So this is how they're approaching it. And what's the latest you've heard on a potential government shutdown and how that could affect the military community? Yeah, so look, the defense appropriations bill that they're talking about, even if it passes the House, it's not going to be taken up in the Senate. And this is really doing nothing to avert a shutdown. Um, The latest on the shutdown talk is the Senate is trying to pass a budget extension um, that would keep uh, government operations open for at least another month, 45 days, somewhere in that range. What we've heard so far from House leaders is they're not going to take that up. They don't like the bill. They're going to come up with their own CR. It's unclear whether or not they have the votes within the Republican caucus to pass that. Appears that we're headed for a shutdown. Um, Would take effect early Sunday morning at midnight on Saturday night. Um, This would create a whole host of problems. The the main ones troops and uh, civilian workers would see would be furloughs and delays to paychecks. Military paychecks would not be delivered in the middle of next month if there is a, a government shutdown going on. And several tens of thousands of civilian Defense Department workers would be furloughed, sent home without pay. Um, they would get pay after a shutdown is done, but they would be told to go home and not work. Only essential workers would show up. Um, so that's a lot of disruption. You know, the, the military doesn't completely close down. There's still the need to provide um, national security. So folks would need to continue to, to perform their missions. There would still be some training programs, some missions, but... A lot of stuff that's not essential would be closed. Um, commissaries would stay open, but hours might get limited. Daycares would close. Non-essential medical appointments on bases would close. Things like mowing the lawn at bases would not happen because that's not essential activities. So, so this is going to affect everyone's lives in the Defense Department. There is a chance that Congress in the 11th hour will pass some protections for military pay, um, especially for active duty and, and Coast Guard pay, which are two uh, you know things that have been hit in the past. But, um, but there's still not a clear plan for that. Um, it's a mess. It's going to be a mess for a lot of folks. And um, right now, it doesn't seem like there's any realistic plan to prevent it. Thanks, Leo. For more conversations like that one, please like and rate us wherever you get your podcasts. Another important story, senators introduced a bill yesterday to give troops and vets easier access to a key federal loan forgiveness program. The proposal focuses on the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Initiative. That can erase thousands of dollars in certain federal student loans for individuals who work in some public service posts. Two years ago, Department of Education officials announced time spent in the military counts toward the public service requirements of the program. But program administrators said only a small fraction of those individuals received the benefit because of confusion surrounding program rules. Lawmakers said part of the problem has been the lack of data sharing agreements between the education and defense departments. The proposal would mandate those arrangements be put in place within a year to enable automatic credit for qualifying troops and veterans. Bill sponsor Senator Catherine Cortez Masto said current operations are, quote, keeping too many military members and veterans from accessing benefits they've earned. Co-sponsor Senator Jerry Moran agreed. Multiple veterans groups, including Student Veterans of America and Veterans Education Success, support the legislation. But as Congress is working to reach a budget deal, it's unclear whether the loan forgiveness legislation can make its way through Congress this year. Also on the radar for today, Army Lieutenant Colonel Frank Rubio returned to Earth after accomplishing a feat no American before him ever achieved. Touchdown. Touchdown confirmed at 6.17 a.m. Central Time. Rubio's record ride comes to an end as he, Prokopiev, and Patelin returned to Earth after a 371-day, 157-million-mile journey at the International Space Station. The soldier-turned-NASA astronaut landed back on solid ground yesterday in Kazakhstan after spending 371 days in low Earth orbit. That earned him the record of the longest single spaceflight by an American. Rubio surpassed the previous United States record of 355 days on September 11th, which was held by NASA astronaut Mark Vandehei. According to the Associated Press, 
Russia holds the world record of longest single space flight at 437 days, set in the mid-1990s. But the year-long trip among the stars was not planned to be quite so lengthy. He and his crew expected to stay only six months, but their spacecraft experienced a coolant leak that resulted in an extension of their mission. Here's why it matters. Prolonged journeys outside Earth's atmosphere filled with various challenges for the isolated astronauts may become more regular. The U.S. is looking toward exploring further in space, including eventual manned missions to Mars. Rubio graduated from the U.S. Military Academy in 1998. He served as a UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter pilot and flew more than 1,100 hours, including about 600 during deployments to Bosnia, Afghanistan, and Iraq. He also earned his Jump Master certification and has conducted more than 650 freefall skydives. At the time of his selection with NASA, Rubio was serving as a battalion surgeon for the 3rd Battalion of the 10th Special Forces Group Airborne at Fort Carson, Colorado. And now, here are some other stories that we're hearing chirps about. In case you missed it, Alabama Republican U.S. Senator Tommy Tuberville said in an interview with Bloomberg Television's Balance of Power this week that the U.S. military is, quote, not an equal opportunity employer. Tuberville said equal opportunity threatens military readiness. He also said he objected to top military officials' efforts to recruit and promote racial minorities in the armed forces. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan said his country's chances of acquiring F-16 fighter jets from the U.S. may be boosted. He said it's because New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez stepped down as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Menendez had been a vocal opponent of Turkey receiving aircraft to update its fighter fleet. He stood down from the influential role last week after he was indicted on federal charges. Erdogan also openly linked Turkey's F-16 bid to Sweden's application for NATO membership. And top military leaders are expected to discuss the Space Command headquarters basing decision in a House Armed Services committee hearing today. It comes after a decision to keep the headquarters in Colorado rather than moving it to Huntsville, Alabama, a move that infuriated Alabama Republicans. And on this day in history, in 1781, the siege known as the Battle of Yorktown began. It's considered one of the most important battles of the Revolutionary War. That's it for us this morning. To get more of the top stories and breaking news, go to defensenews.com slash EBB to subscribe to the Early Bird Brief newsletter. Please give us a like, rating, and a comment wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to follow us on social media at Defense underscore news and at Military Times. The Early Bird Brief is hosted by me, Jonathan Lairfeld, and produced by Zimone Z. Perez. Today's episode features stories by The Associated Press, Leo Shane III, and myself. Our editor-in-chief is Mike Roos. Have a great day.